Welcome, everyone, to the last day of this fabulous conference. Uh, so I am Catherine Corson. I am a professor at Mount Holyoke College and uh, really excited to be here. This panel is going to be fantastic. fantastic. Um, um, as, as you can, can see by the names on the screen, um, there's a really interesting collection of papers. Um, but we, are, we do have five, so the time will be tight, so I'm not going to say any more than that. Um, but just to, to welcome you and um, introduce our first speaker, Claudia Horn. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. So, uh, hello again, good morning. Uh, I'm very excited to be part of this panel uh, and also to be speaking first. <laughs> I hope you're all awake uh, because, um, yeah, I'm going to talk, talk about, about uh, a chapter, chapter I'm, I'm a chapter, chapter out of my, 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 my dissertation. dissertation. Uh, my, my dissertation, dissertation focuses, focuses very, very much on, on, on environmental aid and, and on, uh, on G7, G7 donors, donors in the, in the, in the Brazilian, Brazilian Amazon since, since the 1990s. And this, and this is, is one part out of one chapter about, about, about the technologies, technologies that they, they, that they, they promoted, promoted in the Amazon, the Amazon and, and the particularly environmental, environmental registration. registration. And, uh, and, and this, this, it's, it's important for, for the, the green economy. economy. So, uh, yeah, so we, uh, in, in, on, in the international climate negotiations, uh, there's like high time for the, for the question of payments for environmental services, but also what you hear increasingly uh, is the question of sustainable supply chains. Uh, this is important for potential carbon markets, but this is also important for, for uh, the trade uh, in livestock and, and in commodities. And for instance, this has been crucial, the question of sustainable supply chains and, and deforestation. Free soy has been very much uh, very important in relation to the EU law recently for the deforestation free trade, but also for the EU, EU trade deal with uh, the Mercosur countries. Um, of course, this is very one-sided, um, that, uh, that it's only um, about uh, deforestation in the Amazon. Of course, the EU trade deal is also very, very harmful for labor standards in, in Mercosur. But the question of sustainable supply chains is extremely dominant. So, but you need technologies, so donors uh, and, and investors need technologies to ensure uh, sustainable supply chains, uh, because roughly one-fifth one of the soy that is important in the EU uh, is still from, from potentially deforested areas. And, and so I'm going to talk about uh, what are te the technologies, these systems that can, can, that have been developed with donors for, for environmental registration to make sure that producers don't have environmental liabilities so that it's not from deforested areas. Uh, how these technologies have emerged and what the role of environmental aid was in, in developing these, these, these technologies. And uh, then I'm going to talk about the development of the system in the Brazilian Amazon since the, 90, since the 2000s, actually. And I'm talking about this very controversial history of, of these first experiments in, in the state of Mato Grosso. And then I'm going to talk about the, the agribusiness co-optation of these systems through the new forest code or through the forest code reform and through the environmental registry, the Cadastro Ambiental Rural in Brazil. So first of all, what is the uh, Brazil's environmental registry? What I just said, the Cadastro Ambiental. Uh, it, um, well, in, in Brazil, there exists uh, the forest law, uh, the, the forest code that uh, that. Uh, property owners have to have a certain certain amount of of native forest on their on their land, which can be between 20 and 80 percent. In the Amazon, it's it's 80 percent of native forest, and uh, the so this this registry uh, was supposed to to ensure make a system to make it visible that to make visible the deforestation on private properties. And the system is live since 2014 now. 
Uh, it's in the responsibility of the Brazilian Forest Service within the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock, and it's also being implemented by the state governments. And it's also part um, of, the, of the 2012 Forest Code reform, so it's, um, it's uh, an obligation for states to implement it. And it's heavily in, uh, supported by international finance, very heavily, like almost entirely paid by it, uh, with finance from Germany, the UK, and especially through the Amazon Fund. So 15% of all the Amazon funds go to states for the implementation for the system. Um, but the legal situation in the, in the, the land situation in the legal Amazon is, um, is I think you have heard of, uh, is, is, is complicated and full of conflicts. And, uh, and the system and the state legislation is very uh, lax and very encouraging to the invasion of public lands and uh, to the to land grabbing, grillaging of, of public, forest, uh, public forest land, especially, even though they have the responsibility for this allo um, unallocated area. So there are many unallocated areas. That's roughly a fourth. And uh, yeah, so this is where the, where the land grabbing also mostly happens, uh, apart from also land grabbing of, of collective areas of Quilombola lands, for instance. Uh, yeah, the theoretical framework in, uh, in this work is the regulation approach, and that I'm looking at the, the, the way that uh, state environmental cooperation so, for instance, between Brazil and Germany, Brazil and the UK, regulates uh, the unstable relations of trade and capital accumulation and how certain institutions, policies, or technologies that have been developed through aid uh, have been contributing to avoiding these crises and make, for instance, trade possible, make it sustainable. And, and I've worked on, on, on these topics for, for the last five years in Brazil. So now I'm going to start uh, talking about the, the history uh, of, of, of these technologies. Uh, it goes back to the 90s with the G7 pilot program for the conservation of Brazil's rainforest, who wasn't on the panel yesterday, who had to hear this already, uh, where I spoke about another project, another component of this, this program was civil society. So they didn't obviously uh, promote civil society. What was more important for this pilot program was uh, yeah, the, the natural resource management in the legal Amazon because donors thought that they needed to translate the global desire to preserve the rainforest into effective on-the-ground economic demand for rainforest services and decided to do so in 1990 in Houston without the presence of the Brazilian government. Um, this is just a side note. Um, I don't want to go too much into this program. Uh, yeah, but it was a very long, very influential program because, uh, so, so yeah, but just what's important is that it was funded by the G7 countries, the European Commission, uh, and, uh, and also the World Bank. The World Bank was, was, of course, fundamental to the conceptualization of these projects. And um, ah. so for the development of technology, it's important that uh, this program funded the uh, environmental policy in, in the Amazon states. Uh, especially, uh, the, it's, its natural resource policy projects, that there was one component, um, was active in, in the nine Amazon states, and it had a, had a large component also of technical aid. So not, not, not only financial aid, but technical aid from DFID in certain states, and then GIZ, uh, the German development agency in, in other states. So it kind of divided it in a colonial way uh, to, to be responsible for these states. And then they funded uh, environmental secretaries in each state from the ground out, paying, paying for tables, paying for computers, paying for capacity development. So this was very much like this was in the 90s in the, um, in the time of uh, multi-stakeholder uh, methodologies uh, and um, participatory methodologies. So here you see a picture of uh, economic environmental zoning. And this is also something that I focus on. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, so the, the idea that economic, social, and environmental interests could be harmonized, and they, they tried to implement it in the, in the state. Went terribly wrong, or <laughs> uh, 
uh, didn't have much impact, but it created a lot of systems, archival systems, technologies, like uh, this experiment of environmental licensing of, uh, of rural properties uh, in Mato Grosso, uh, starting from 2000. Mato Grosso uh, in Brazil is, is the main soy producing state uh, and there are very large landovers, also a lot of quilombola lands, uh, but uh, this is where it started uh, the development of the system uh, because they wanted to have a system that would combine the licensing, the environmental licensing of, on private properties, but also the monitoring of, the, of deforestation on their land and, and then potentially the fining uh, for deforestation. So uh, it was a, the first experiment was uh, targeting properties over 300 hectares who were responsible for 80% of the deforestation in the state. Mm -hmm. And, and it was very successful in the beginning because landowners owners had to submit um, georeference uh, um, information about their deforestation. And so, so first it actually reduced deforestation in Mato Grosso. What happened then? There was a new government, uh, the state government of Blero Maggi, the, the soy king, um, like, a, like a, a soy farmer, a very influential figure in Brazil, uh, who became the governor. And the, the implementation of the system reversed because they were suddenly giving out tons of licenses without actually verif verifying the deforestation on these lands. So they were in fact legitimizing deforestation on these lands, giving out licenses. And deforestation went up. But with, despite this experience of, of complete abuse of the system, uh, it became super uh, promoted by the World Bank and other states and implemented it as well subsequently. TNC became responsible for, the, uh, for a technology to do registrations in masses. Uh, and, and it also, when it became from, when it turned from, from in 2010 from, from this one system to, to the Cadastro Ambiental Rural, it became more flexible and wouldn't be necessarily be linked to fines. Uh, and it's very imp interesting, actually, the, the role of TNC in this, because the, the head of TNC was prior, was, was prior the DFID's uh, state environmental advisor, jo Joao Campari, and he became TNC director, and then he became special advisor of Blero Maggi, when he was the minister of agriculture in Brazil, and then, and then now he's at WWF. Then in 2012, the new forest code um, rever or was, a, was a very clear sign of, of, the, of the rising power of agribusiness agri in Brazil, and, and the environmental registry became part of that, in, in also setting up a national offset type system for the trade in, in certificates for non deforestation. So um, the cadastro, this, this environmental license is fundamental in this system, but it's also fundamental for, for international payments for ecosystem services. The problem is that uh, it's based today on self-registration, so uh, everyone who has, um, who has a computer could potentially register their land, and it's required to receive credit. And uh, there has been, in the, in the, in the years of implementation, uh, many overlaps with public and indigenous quilombola lands, uh, it's, there's a big lag in monitoring and verifying. Uh, it's been used as de facto land title, even though it's not uh, supposed to establish land rights. Uh, and uh, it's made for private landowners. And so collective um, use um, and communities have had a really, really hard time to get their land registered. So what's been happening is actually the system been used to do large scale land grabbing in Brazil. And here's a picture of a community, actually, that when they, after years, uh, it's Bagre in, in Marajó, in Pará, when they managed to register their environmental, uh, when they, to get their environmental registration to, re to regularize. And so, uh, yeah, to, to finalize this, um, I think these technologies are, are um, very important to look at uh, and, and how they look on the ground and what their history is uh, and what, what they mean if they're, um, because, this system, for instance, and went from the idea of deforestation control to actually only uh, licensing. And it also shows kind of the, the way that donors are very keen to work on technologies, um, but not uh, 
on, on actually necessarily file, uh, verifying and doing the work. And, and it's, it, also play, it also relates to this larger um, shift in environmental regulation from, from, from sanctions and regulation to incentives. And yeah, I wanted to show how, how aid uh, investment has been important uh, to that. And it's, of course, important to have more participatory mechanisms that focus on traditional communities. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. I should have said we'll save questions until the end. Um, we'll just go through the presentations and then we'll, we'll talk about them all together. Um, so, uh, first of all, I just want to um, thank Adrian and others for organizing this. Um, it's really nice to be in person, um, as I'm sure we all are happy to be here. Um, and this is a work in progress, um, a draft of some very uh, recent research that I've been doing with um, Noella Gray and Victoria Hudson, both from the University of Guelph. Um, and I changed the title from the program because we're still working on our argument and we finalized it a little bit more last week. Um, so we're really interested in your feedback. Um, and I'm going to just begin. Um, in 2021, when at the Our Land, Our Nature Congress, which took place the day before the International Union for the Conservation of Nature's uh, World Conservation Congress, um, when Fior Longo, the head of Survival International's Decolonizing Conservation Campaign, argued that the 30 by 30 plan, or the proposed global biodiversity framework target to protect at least 30% of terrestrial and inland water areas and of marine and coastal areas by 2030, constituted the biggest land grab in world history. Likewise, in April 2021, 249 organizations and individuals, some of whom are here at the conference, um, signed a letter against 30 by 30, arguing, we are concerned about the 30% target in the zero draft global biodiversity framework. We believe this target could further entrench an outmoded and unsustainable model of conservation that could dispossess people least responsible for these crises on their lands and livelihoods. Simultaneously, the Human Rights and Biodiversity Working Group, formed in 2020, of organizations like the Forest People's Program, International Indigenous Forum on Biodiversity, or the IIFB, the ICCA Consortium, and many others, produced a series of publications aimed to highlight what it takes to integrate a human rights-based approach into the GBF. And as the preparatory process for the 15th Conference of the Parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity extended from 2020 to 2022 during the COVID pandemic, the IIFB, which is the primary liaison and strategic organizing coordinating group for indigenous people in environment, UN environmental agreements, focused not on challenging 30 by 30, but instead pushing it to recognize indigenous rights and traditional territories within what became target three. Okay, so um, at the conclusion of the December uh, 2020 conference, the IIFB and many rights holders uh, organizations commended the text. And I will let you um, read the final version, um, the gobbledygook that it is, um, with the relevant sections in red. Um, and they commended it for its strong language on uh, respect for the rights of indigenous people and local communities, or IPLCs, and the inclusion, in particular, of indigenous and traditional territories. So many saw this as offering a third pathway to conservation, in addition to traditional protected areas or other uh, effective area-based conservation, uh, or OECMs, um, and a means to use 30 by 30 to recognize IPLC land and resource rights. So what we're interested in broadly is the leverage that's provided by the discursive shift to frame um, long-standing struggles against green grabs as basic human rights issues, and how the inclusion of this language in the GBF, recognizing indigenous and traditional territories, opens up opportunities for securing land and resource rights through conservation. Um, 
So uh, our analysis draws on a collaborative ethnography of the 15th um, Conference of the Parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity, COP15, which was held in Montreal um, in December 2022, um, as well as the preparatory meetings that took place between 2020 and 2022. Um, and we examine the process by which a transnational alliance of rights holders um, got, like, got this language into Target 3 by using direct lobbying, press conferences, um, uh, side events, publications, um, and uh, opportunities to speak after states um, in the negotiations themselves. And how specifically they capitalized on a couple of things that came together over the last couple of years. First, the rising pressure on conservation organizations and states to recognize and acknowledge the colonial legacies of conservation. Um, second, the foundation that the convention's Article 8J, which stipulates that states and parties shall respect indigenous and local community knowledge and practices, as well as equitably share benefits. Um, and then emerge in studies that are showing that 80% of the world's biodiversity exists on uh, lands managed by indigenous people. As well as this, the sort of space and time that was provided by the COVID pandemic, um, which forced negotiations um, and conversations online and or into hybrid preparatory processes, which really allowed the organizing of a, of a broader social movement. Um, and then finally, the pressure on states to come up with 30% um, of their territory, which was easier for some than others. And so all of these collectively created a space that um, the IAFB and others could step into. Um, but most importantly, the UN um, passed in July 2022 um, the, the UN Declaration on the Rights to a Clean, Healthy, and Sustainable Environment, which has provided um, significant leverage, um, and in the words of Special Rapporteur David Boyd, um, taken on a life of its own, catalyzing uh, conversations and actions all over the world. So um, we argue that endorsing 30 by 30 gave rights holders a seat at the table. Um, and inclusion of indigenous territories into the GBF um, anchored the UN right to a healthy environment spatially as a right to territory. Uh, so while the GBF is non-binding, of course, the discursive shift that it embodies provides leverage for pressure on states. Um, as it frames territories as basic human rights, it acknowledges IPLC roles as protectors of world's biodiversity, and it emphasizes not in this language, but elsewhere in the GBF, um, free prior and informed consent. However, we also saw at COP15 the rising uh, level of uh, private sector participation, the highest to date at a, at a COP, um, and, you know, note in particular changes like in the GBF, the commitment to mo mobilize 200, million, uh, 200 billion on biodiversity finance only mandates that um, 20 to 30 billion of that be from state funds. So the, the remainder can, of course, be from private sector funds. Um, and at the same time, the increasing emphasis on market-based approaches, um, such as biodiversity offsets and credits, will make territorial claims harder. So for this paper, we're really interested in reflecting on the leverage that the language provides, um, as well as its limitations for protecting IPLC rights and territories against green grabs. Um, so I just want to talk very briefly about the methodology of collaborative ethnography. Um, so it is an approach that I've been um, involved in and using for um, over a decade now. Um, in which teams of researchers come together to study global uh, environmental conferences um, ethno ethnographically through the lens, um, to study environmental governance through the lens of the conference. Um, and we approach these conferences as political spaces that align um, actors around um, particular sanctioned logics um, and look at governance as processual, dynamic, contingent, constituted through constantly shifting assemblages uh, that collectively configure governance. Um, and so what we're interested in here is how the rights-based approach offers opportunities for reworking uh, these dynamics. So COP15 had been uh, originally scheduled to take place in Kunming, China uh, in October 2020. 
Um, and the key goal had been to secure agreement on the post-2020 about global biodiversity framework, um, which was to both comprise the strategic plan and a set of biodiversity targets, one of which was target three, to guide the CBD's work through 2030. And so we'd planned to attend this meeting, but then when the COVID pandemic um, broke out, um, shifted our methodology um, to look virtually at the negotiations and then in a hybrid format and then ultimately in, in December um, in person. Um, and so elsewhere we write about um, how this move to virtual and hybrid um, and ultimately in-person negotiations influenced uh, the overall process but also um, how it influenced our own methodology, and in particular thinking about the affordances of virtual technologies and embodied experiences on um, the ways in which assemblages come together, uh, as well as the way in which we operated um, as our own team. So I'm happy to talk about that um, later. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the scholarship um, that we're engaged with, except just to say that it, it builds on work I've been doing for more than a decade on the rise of the human rights-based agenda um, within the UN um, and how that provides leverage or not in particular ways, um, as well as the challenges of using that, um, its limitations in depol depoliticizing struggles for justice um, tendencies to undermine collective governance, um, and in fact, uh, often being used for, uh, to enable commodification and privatization as opposed to uh, opposing it. Um, as well as I think we're also engaging with the politics of uh, recognition, concern over colonial entanglements, thus the, the title of the panel, um, state power and the potential for co-optation. So I think, um, as you all know, the politics of recognition um, illuminates attention for indigenous people around and, and uh, their allies around the decisions to engage or not engage in, in colonial institutions and in state-led processes. So um, that's, that's what we're exploring in part here. Um, so I wanna just focus on one piece of this um, and then I will conclude after that. Um, so I think during the final negotiations, one of the key issues was how to recognize indigenous and traditional territories in Target 3, but not in doing so to subsume them under the authority of national parks agencies. Um, and so here are two quotes by the IIFB. Um, one um, stating early on in the final December COP, um, there is no way to achieve Target 3 without recognizing and protecting and promoting some of the territorial rights of indigenous peoples and local communities. That's the human rights, the territorial rights of indigenous people, which en enables the realization of the target. So framing the recognition of indigenous and traditional territories as necessary for uh, actually achieving target three. Um, and I think you know, that was um, the idea that Indigenous people protect 80% of the world's biodiversity, provided a significant amount of leverage in the negotiations. But then, of course, in the final negotiations, they argued that even though this is a proven pathway, um, using phrases that were up until the very final negotiations, which may include and including as options preceding indigenous and traditional territories, effectively incorporated our territories under state regulation and conservation frameworks potentially undermining self-determination, regulation, and conservation frameworks. The IIFB considers, and, and um, these as red lines, using which may include or including will further subsume indigenous and traditional territories. So we call on parties to support the text and indigenous and traditional territories in this part of target three and delete which may include or including. So the idea being um, that they did not want, and if I'll show you the final text again, um, they did not want indigenous and traditional territories to be included as OECMs um, underneath and or part of state recognized uh, territories because of course in many places um, uh, that would undermine self-determination where uh, indigenous and uh, indigenous protected areas are already uh, recognized and or in places where indigenous communities self-recognize even when states do not. Um, so there was, a, there was a kind of slippery road there. And ultimately, um, when you look at this incredibly messy, confusing text, you see that the kind of grammatical 
sleight of hand leaves it very ambiguous as to whether indigenous and traditional territories are in fact a third category. Uh, so um, I think that you know, we're arguing that endorsing the 30 by 30 territory gave rights holders and their allies leverage to push for more recognition of traditional rights. Um, and, and it advanced the long-term uh, work on human rights-based approach by anchoring it as a territorial right, as a spatial dimension of the claim. The right to territory provides a mechanism to counter land grabs. And while it's a non-binding text, it does contain this discursive shift that provides points of leverage through media and other campaigns for activists to pressure governments. Um, however, this moment is also witness to the consolidation of elite power, the rising influence of the corporate sector within the CBD, specifically through conservation finance and market-based approaches. So it really remains to be seen what leverage this will, in fact, provide um, in on-the-ground struggles to secure land rights and resource rights. So the emphasis is really turned to the translation of these inclusions um, on the ground. And so ensuring that these advances at the global level do not mask power relations that in fact do the opposite. So attention by the IAFB and others has turned to um, a few things. First, um, advocating for national legislation and policy. But second, the translation of funding, um, specifically via the Global Environment Facility, but also private financing to IPLCs. Third, the inclusion of indicators that measure this recognition of territories and customary lands, as well as measure, reward, recognize countries that implement uh, measures um, related to FPIC, for example. And then fourth, um, the discussion and debate that some of you may be involved in around um, within various scientific um, venues for recognizing diverse knowledges and ways of being. And then finally, the idea of reparations, um, understanding the impact of centuries of marginalization under racialized colonialism and continuing power relations entailed in post-colonial uh, racialized capitalism. So within that, of course, is the continuing struggle against the financialization, corporatization, and privatization of conservation and the rising embrace of market-based approaches like biodiversity credits um, and offsets that create perverse incentives, which are in fact counter. Um, it will be provide incentives countering um, a lot of the progress that this could potentially make. So um, I want to stop there, and then maybe we can talk in questions a little bit more about it. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm James Stinson, a postdoctoral fellow at York University in Toronto. I'm going to be co-presenting with uh, Lee McLaughlin uh, from Florida International University. Uh, we're also working on this project and paper with uh, Re Rebecca Zarger from the University of South Florida. Um, so this paper is a very preliminary presentation of some of the results of a project uh, that we're working on, which is looking at uh, the use of the spatial monitoring and reporting tool, referred to as SMART, uh, which is a digital um, conservation law enforcement platform, which is used to uh, collect and analyze uh, ranger patrol data in parks and protected areas. And uh, what we're really interested in is how this digital platform and other digital, uh, digital uh, surveillance tools are really changing relations of power uh, within and around protected areas, uh, but also um, changing relations as well um, re relations of power and authority within conservation organizations themselves, but also even brought more broadly relations between North and South in uh, sort of the global conservation landscape. Um, so we are th uh, going to be presenting um, some of the work that we've been doing on this in Belize, uh, and also talking about how we're framing this overall uh, project and what we're finding um, theoretically as well. Um, so just to give you a broad outline of what we're going to do, I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about the theoretical context, which we're framing largely within uh, the literature on environmentality and more recently onto power. Uh, we'll talk about the empirical context in Belize, um, where we are kind of situating the study within a broad shift that we see, uh, which is a movement away from sort of community-based approaches to conservation um, towards more militarized and enforcement-based approaches to managing uh, protected areas. Uh, we'll talk about the spatial monitoring reporting tool itself, 
and, and then some of the major themes and issues we've been looking at in terms of scales of uh, onto power and threat, uh, predictive uh, detection, um, transformations in fortress conservation, and the production of new types of environmental subjects. Um, so just to begin theoretically, again, we're framing this work broadly within the literature on environmentality. Um, and an, an overall shift that we see in Belize and elsewhere, um, where we see shifts in protected area management from uh, community-based approaches, uh, much more towards more militarized approaches. We're describing this in our work as a shift from uh, what Arun Agarwal refers to as intimate government, uh, toward algorithmic onto power. Um, so it, within community-based approaches to conservation, Arun Agarwal has talked about how uh, this, this approach to conservation often relies on uh, the instrumentalization of local knowledge and local social ties within communities um, in order to kind of enroll local community actors in state conservation projects. Um, I think more theoretically, uh, this type of community-based approach to conservation often relies on disciplinary or panoptic uh, techniques, as well as things like neoliberal incentives and the pr promotion of ecotourism um, and so forth in order to produce what are often referred to as environmental subjects, uh, people who basically conform to environmental uh, regulations around protected areas. Um, so the part, part of the overall shift that we are seeing and, and describing in Belize is a move away from that more community-based uh, approach to conservation and the attempts to create environmental subjects uh, towards what we're calling uh, algorithmic onto power. Um, so this term onto power comes from the work of Brian Masumi and his work in security studies and, and the war on terror and so forth. Uh, Masumi has made the argument that onto power has become the, um, the, the dominant governmentality of the present age that we live in. And he really describes onto power as being characterized by a logic of preemption. So the logic uh, within you know, military interventions and policing uh, has really kind of shifted towards uh, trying to preempt threats rather than uh, to address some of the underlying causes of these uh, issues. More recently, Bram Boucher has used this uh, concept of onto power and applied it within uh, the context of biodiversity conservation to kind of rethink some of the more recent shifts toward more militarized and violent approaches to conservation, um, which we see happening in many places. Um, so we um, are basically building on the work of both Masumi and Boucher, but arguing that we don't just see onto power um, sort of in, in efforts to preempt um, threats to biodiversity through violence, but we see onto power also articulating with sort of new digital technologies and algorithms and artificial intelligence to create sort of new, more automated and algorithmic types of pre preemption, which we'll describe when we talk about SMART. So this is kind of the overall theoretical context that we're working in. So I'm just gonna pass it over to Lee, who will talk about some of the, the, the empirical context that we're working within. So yeah, a little bit about Belize. Um, it's a country in Central America um, on the Caribbean with um, high forest cover showing yeah. um, High levels of forest cover, um, just under about 55%, and the um, second largest barrier reef in the world. It's got an extensive protected area system, which you can see on the right. Um, covers about 40% currently of the um, Belize's territory. Um, and protected area management in, the, in Belize from the 90s was focusing very much on community-based approaches um, through to about 2015 when we detected this kind of change um, towards more militarized and police-based approaches. So there's that kind of, um, you know, a, a replacement of, uh, of approach. And... Then, yeah, so what Masumi was saying was, um, well, one of the things that he focused on was the emergence of this onto power in um, the invasion of Iraq. So you can see there's a quote from the um, wonderful George Bush here at the top, um, talking about how uh, you've got to take the battle to the enemy, um, disrupt their plans and confront those threats before they emerge. Um, 
and the, the kind of focus on acting. And then we saw um, this kind of similar um, discourse in some of the language of um, global NGOs who are um, particularly active in places like Belize, such as Wildlife Conservation Society, um, in terms of the uh, illegal wildlife trade. So looking at how um, emergency crisis and fear was coming out in these, um, in these discourses. Here, wildlife trade and trafficking in Latin America hasn't reached the crisis levels that it has in Southeast Asia and Africa yet. Um, but it's saying that uh, similar conditions were present um, and that because of this, preventative measures can and must be taken now to prevent repetition. So again, it's about um, justifying this preemptive action against illegal wildlife trade in Belize. Um, and this was kind of paralleled by a shift away from community-based approaches and towards um, militarized and policing-based approaches. And, and at this time, I was working for Wildlife Conservation Society in Belize from about 2015 to uh, 2020, uh, 2021. Um, and I'd, I'd seen uh, there was a big focus um, on kind of gathering the evidence to justify the, those claims of this uh, emerging threat and, and crisis, um, kind of after the fact in a way. Um, and a lot of this was based on uncertain and patchy evidence. Um, you can't really see it, but this document on the left is talking about how millions of dollars are lost annually to the illegal wildlife trade in Belize, but the, the actual data, um, it's not really based on, um, on, on solid uh, primary research. Um, and then there was also a kind of parallel change in donor priorities, uh, like funders for conservation in Belize at this time, um, which was leading to this kind of uh, change in narratives um, of NGOs and, and conservation media um, towards this fear and, and crisis, saying that Belize is, a, is engaged in a war, uh, which again, this is this shift from kind of bottom-up community approaches towards this uh, climate of fear and crisis. I'll just pass back to Jim. How are we doing for time? Okay, so I'll just go through this really quickly. But um, so, in addition to this overall effort to really preempt um, the establishment of the illegal wildlife trade in Belize, the use of digital technologies like Smart has played a big role in this process. Uh, Smart is, is a digital platform that includes many components from uh, mobile data collection by rangers. Um, to sort of database and data analysis tools on a desktop, as well as cloud computing servers, and more recently even uh, predictive uh, AI um, to predict the future locations of threat. Um, so one of the things that we're looking at is how this, these technologies allow for the detection of threats that can be preempted sort of at different scales. Um, so with Smart, you have Smart Mobile, which is a mobile device used by rangers to collect data within protected areas. This is used to create heat maps of threat within PA parks and protected areas themselves. More recently, this type of, of app has been expanded to communities around protected areas to sort of increase the scope of these heat and threat maps to uh, buffer areas around parks and protected areas. And then finally, uh, cloud-based servers are being used in Belize to create a national database of all ranger data from all parks and protected areas to be able to create a sort of heat and threat maps at national scales as well. And then, as I said, more recently, there's been advances in what's called Pause AI, which is a predictive um, policing component of SMART, which is able to use this past ranger data to predict future locations of crime within parks and protected areas so that rangers can actively go out and preempt threats before they actually materialize. Um, so you can see on the bottom here, they say, with Smart 7, our ability to, to, to detect and respond to threats in real time will shift the focus from where poaching has happened to where poaching is about to happen. So we really see this preemptive logic, not just kind of globally focusing on Belize, but within specific locations within PAs through the use of this data um, and AI tools. Um, so another significant change we see with these digital tools uh, has to do with sort of changes within fortress conservation itself. 
Um, the smart system is designed to work with a, a range of digital sensing technologies from remote cameras, infrared cameras, acoustic recording devices, um, satellite imagery and so forth to, to basically detect anyone who's, who's going into uh, a park or protected area. So we see this really in some ways as a movement away from the sort of panoptic uh, fences and fines approach to fortress conservation, which is about deterring people from going into protected areas towards a new model of smart fortress conservation, which is much more focused on simply using this technology to detect incursions into protected areas in real time in order to facilitate real time preemption. And part of this is an invisibilization of, of these fences to create sort of digital fences with things like these very small cameras that can't be detected so that you know, they'll just be able to uh, basically alert conservation organizations in real time and they won't be spotted by people, they won't be a deterrent. And also this shift towards what's called total coverage uh, rather than relying on sort of ranger patrols as a spectacle that um, sort of induces compliance there's this new emphasis on sort of just increasing the total coverage of uh, ranger patrols and surveillance so that everything's being surveilled um, constantly and continually, creating sort of total surveillance environments. Uh, so finally, we also see, on the one hand, we have this movement away from trying to create environmental subjects that conform to protected area regulations, but this coincides with a much more intense disciplining and creation of new environmental subjects on the part of conservation staff themselves, including rangers and, and park managers, who are now subject to intense digital disciplining um, themselves, specifically rangers who are carrying and using these digital devices and continually being tracked. Their, their jobs and their, their work is much more, rendered much more visible to their managers. Uh, but SMART is really about a, a, a retraining of conservation staff you know, from the level of the executive to the managers to the rangers um, at all levels, um, which I think is, is really significant. And then, yeah, the final point that I want to make is that, um, you know, this case study in Belize isn't just um, significant because it's happening in Belize. Uh, SMART's a platform that's used in over 80 countries and over a thousand countries around the world. And I think it's really important for us to be thinking about how this digital model of enforcement is really being rolled out in a very inequitable way. This is a map of, of countries and locations that are using SMART. You can see that it's used almost exclusively in the global south. Um, it's not used really in any northern countries, even though it's developed through funding from northern conservation NGOs and uh, technology companies like Microsoft um, and so forth. So it's really a technology that's being developed by the global north to be used in the global south to promote this uh, type of enforcement. Um, yeah, so I think I've gone, gone through all the main points we wanted to raise, but I think we see this shift towards post-panoptic enforcement. Uh, it's a new model of, of smart fortress conservation. Um, yeah, it coincides with this new kind of post-panoptic model of parks, but also an intense disciplining of uh, conservation staff. And within the context of 30 by 30, it's really important for us to be thinking about these transformations as, um, you know, with these global efforts to really intensively expand parks and protected areas. I think these digital technologies, um, which are really promoting this uh, sort of more digital enforcement based approach, are really important to think through the implications of them. Thank you. I'm going to get straight into it because we don't have too much time and I want some time for questions. Um, so we've heard from the last few presentations on what could be the potential political and social implications of using uh, technologies, digital technologies and technologies of surveillance. Um, my research takes a little different lens to this and, and I talk about how digital technologies or technologies of surveillance can also be co-opted by indigenous communities uh, to counter map or, or resist the conservation state in itself. 
Uh, a lot of this research is uh, still in process. I've just done three months of ethnographic field work and I'm supposed to go back for three months more. Um, and it kind of builds on my PhD research, which looked at the social and political implications of conservation surveillance technologies uh, in, con uh, in protected area management. Um, so as James was saying in his presentation that fortress conservation and conservation surveillance are going together these days. It's become an invisible fortress as such. Um, borrowing heavily from the ideas of panopticism and, uh, you know, green governmentality. Uh, there are a whole range of technologies that are used, things like camera traps, drones, there are thermal sensors, uh, digital applications like the ranger-based law enforcement monitoring software that James was talking about. Um, but still overall in protected areas around the world, it's camera traps, drones, and really high-powered thermal cameras that are used in a very large scale. And just to give you a small example, uh, in 2018, India's tiger estimation exercise went into the Guinness Book of World Records for actually using 50,000 camera traps uh, in one year uh, for estimating their tiger population. So that's the amount of uh, camera traps that are being used in India's protected areas. Um, uh, camera traps are also used to kind of keep tab on staff. So there is there's workplace surveillance as well. Um, and now the social and political implications of uh, these technologies are being documented empirically. Some of my research looks at that. Uh, there's some research from Nepal. There's some now research from, by James in Belize. There is uh, research in, um, in Philippines as well on acoustic monitoring technologies. Um, my research particularly looked at uh, how surveillance technologies were, eng you know, uh, were having sociopolitical implications and they were affecting gendered uh, forest use, there was a huge implication on caste, uh, how technologies of surveillance were being used to socially sort uh, certain populations of people, uh, example, uh, targeting Muslim communities or Adivasis in India by these technologies, and also affecting labor practices of frontline forest staff. Continuing on my PhD research, I kind of changed the lens a little bit, uh, and that's, this is what I'm doing for my postdoc. Uh, where I'm looking at how these same technologies that are used by the conservation state can also be appropriated by indigenous communities to resist the same conservation policy that these technologies reinforce. Um, I'm asking questions like, what is the scope for countermapping through these technologies, and what kind of socio-political implications emerge from such use? Um, my case is with this indigenous pastoralist community called as the One Gujars, who are a Muslim Adivasi community from the mountains, uh, the Himalayas of uh, Uttarakhand, the North Indian state in, in India. Uh, they practice transhumans uh, and they've had a history of continued dispossession because of increasing privatization of land and by land grabs by the conservation state. They've been at the receiving end of violent eviction and displacement and at the receiving uh, end of conservation surveillance. Uh, for example, there is a quote from one of my interviewees where he talks about, they intentionally fly the drone at low level above our buffaloes so that the cattle panic and scatter. It is a harassment tactic. But these same uh, communities are now using the same technologies as uh, acts of resistance. So for example, camera traps are now being used as a means of surveillance. Uh, surveillance is a concept that is uh, well described in surveillance studies, which basically, uh, you know, surveillance is a view from above while surveillance is a view from below. Um, and there's a, there a quote here where um, an, one of the village elders is saying that we bought an old camera trap to show that the forest departments or their tiger was coming from the national park to kill our buffaloes. We got it in our camera trap and now we could claim compensation. Uh, there are also GPS digital markers, G GPS systems that are being used by the indigenous communities to counter conservation knowledge production that is normally being done by the conservation state, mostly by biologists and academics. Um, there's a quote here which says, we don't trust the forest department's claim that tigers are using 90% of this landscape. We are making, marking tiger locations whenever we come across bug marks using our own GPS systems to counter the claim. Um, Using camera traps has also become a kind of a safety measure from political persecution, which this community is uh, undergoing at the moment. Um, for example, there's a quote here which says that there is an atmosphere against Muslims in this area and the state is persecuting us. We have now deployed cameras to monitor any outsiders coming in and going out of our settlements. So there is a, there is a kind of resistance that the, the communities are showing using the same technologies that the government uses to monitor them or produce knowledge for conservation. But most importantly, in the context of India, um, you know, there is, we're talking about 30 into 30 and indigenous, 
indigenous land and conservation indigenous land. There is a landmark law in India called the Forest Rights Act, which came as early as 2006, uh, 2005, 2006, which aims to give back land to indigenous communities that was taken away from them first uh, after colonialism and then uh, later by the Indian state. Um, it recognizes the rights of forest dwellers, and one of the rules under the Forest Rights Act is for communities to gain or gain access to these lands back, uh, they need to show evidence of, uh, of their use or past use or current use of, of these lands. And Rule 13.1 basically says that evidence uh, for recognition and vesting of forest rights may be with maps and satellite imagery, documentation of customs and traditions. And this community that I work with is now using uh, drones and satellite imagery and GPS markers for, for, these, for these claims. Um, there is a lot of literature on counter-mapping, actually. There's, yesterday, during the Indaba, uh, you know, there was a speaker talking about it. There is emerging work from South America, from conservation context. There is also work from Southeast Asia. Um, and the act of indigenous communities resisting traditional map making by states and corporates is what uh, counter mapping is all about. But it looks like in India, this seems like the first example of a community systematically using aerial imagery to claim rights uh, and evidence for assertion of tenure. Uh, so, for example, there's a quote where uh, uh, these Van Gujars are saying that they use the same drone to monitor our movements. So, our organization came together, contributed money, and got our own drone. Uh, and what are the kind of claims that can be made using these, the same drones that the conservation state uses? Right? There are possibilities under the Forest Rights Act as a form of evidence for assertion of rights. Uh, for example, uh, they, they talk about that drone imagery is actually better than a map that is made by GPS points uh, or satellite imagery. And this is a better way to submit our claims. The claims are much stronger. Um, with drones, the communities are also analyzing their grazing patterns of their buffaloes, migration routes, invasive species spread, uh, kind of contributing uh, knowledge, uh, a new kind of knowledge or plural, plural knowledge production that is very different from the knowledge that is produced by the same device when it is operated by the state. Um, interestingly, uh, you know, cultural markers like burial grounds or Eidgahs that are invisible in satellite imagery become much more visible when uh, drones are used. And these are markers that uh, are submitted as claims under the Forest Rights Act, which, uh, which are, are recognized by the courts as, as uh, important claim making uh, markers. Um, and there's one quote in the uh, below where uh, Van Gujar is talking about satellite maps of the government cannot show our cultural markers, such as generations of our burial grounds. And, uh, and then they say we are encroachers. Uh, Low-flying drones can deter these. Um, but these uh, technologies also come with their own challenges. Using these technologies are actually technically illegal within a protected area. Uh, but communities have found ways to actively subvert the conservation state. Um, the area that I work in, uh, your forest guards or rangers do not allow uh, the Van Gujars to actually fly the drone or use GPS devices inside the forest. But how do these communities then counter that is by, for example, this quote where uh, somebody says that forest guards restrict us from uh, the GPS, using the GPS, or confiscate it when we use it. But we hang the GPS devices on the horns of our buffaloes in a herd of 100, and they do the mapping for us. Uh, these technologies also come with their own risks. Um, there is a sort of a loss of imagination and indigenous sense of place and space. If you can see in that picture, there is a pastoral, uh, like one of the one of the one goodgers holding up a map, which is uh, which is hand drawn. Uh, and he says that in the quote below that the maps I create but create by hand are much more accurate. We can record a hundred year old tree, a place where my favorite buffalo is buried, a place where elephants are frequently seen. And, and, and these are kind of plural imaginations or uh, indigenous sense of place and space that are made invisible with these technologies. There are also uh, huge implications for gender. Uh, women do not really get to use it or have any voice in the use of these technologies uh, because the community is extremely patriarchal in nature. And at the same time, um, the, these technologies like drones and camera traps have the same kind of surveillance capabilities uh, which could, uh, you know, the first thing that uh, the communities wanted to do when a drone was introduced to them was fly it over somebody's house. Um, and, and that is something about the drone as a technology, uh, and that's a question that I keep asking myself, that is it, is it something about the drone and its imagination that triggers that kind of a surveillance response? Um, 
So for example, uh, the quote on the right, uh, there's a one good who's saying that we can also use the drone to make sure we are grazing our cattle in ag our agreed areas. If another good trespasses and we deter it, uh, and we detect it the, in the drone, we can report it to the council. So it's, it's some, something like less mirroring the state, you know, surveilling each other. So there are whole kinds of possibilities that are happening, uh, happening here. Um, so to conclude, uh, you know, these are some of the questions that I'm asking, that can conservation surveillance technologies uh, be appropriated by victims of the conservation state to counter its spatial narratives? What are the kinds of social politics that then emerge uh, when uh, indigenous communities like the one Gujars emerge in counter mapping practices for the assertion of their rights? And how does this more importantly speak to emerging practices of data justice in conservation than Dan Brockington was speaking on on the first day? And then can finally, can these technologies create plural imaginations of land use, rights, and sovereignty? Or will they end up reflecting modern to dominant motions of uh, private ownership? Thank you for listening. Um, so maybe I'll call the panelists up. We have about 10 minutes for questions. Do we have a portable microphone we could use? How's that? Okay. Thanks, everyone. This was, this was really great. Really interesting stuff. And, uh, and so, yeah, fascinating how these new technologies are, are interacting with kind of questions that we've been posing for a longer time. I had a question, Catherine. Uh, other effective conservation measures, OECMs, could that be one of the ways in which these uh, territories are going to be uh, mapped without being incorporated into state conservation uh, areas? I don't know if you know of OECMs. Yes, you do. Um, and, and then maybe for oh, sorry, maybe maybe for Trishan, uh, really fascinating stuff. Um, there's a long, I think, tradition in political ecology on counter mapping. It goes back to Leila Harris, Nancy Peluso. Are you also thinking about trying to tell us the kind of longer history and what's, what's changing and, and what remains the same maybe with the introduction of these new technologies? I think that would be a fascinating uh, a story to tell. Uh, I have many more, but I should move, give the mic to someone else. So uh, I have one question for Claudia that uh, you have done five years of field work and you have given the historical perspective. And in these many years, the government has changed from extreme right wing to now Lula. And, there are, there are other governments as well. So have you seen any kind of difference in uh, kind of in engaging with this eco-modernist interventions by different governments? Uh, second to Kath Catherine is that uh, there, there are different right-based right groups from survival to other kinds of groups. Uh, so, and some groups want to be in the table, some groups don't want to be in the table. So have you seen any kind of rupture or fracture between these right-based right groups uh, during these kinds of negotiations? and? Uh, uh, one to James as well that in the pause AI uh, monitoring, uh, what are the exact variables are chosen to predict the whole thing? Uh, and last probably to Trishan that uh, why communities are taking this so high tech things? I mean, there are, there are mobiles which can do all these things. So what, what is going on? Okay, why don't we, we'll take one more and then we'll answer. I don't know how much time we have, but then maybe the panelists could just stay for a few minutes because it looks like there's lots of questions and, and we can, uh, if we hit time, then we can talk informally. And you're next. Thank you, it's Tim Bilavimbi from South African National Biodiversity Institute. Um, I had a question for the guys that did the study on Belize. Um, one of the studies um, you presented was on the I think it's the, yeah, it's about wildlife trade. It's the wildlife conservation society slide that you um, you talked on and speaking about how in Latin America, um, they have not reached the crisis that Southeast Asia and Africa. Um, I'd like to differ <laughs> from that statement. I think Africa and specifically, specifically South Africa is doing quite great in the management of their megafauna. And also, I wanted to understand um, what were you taking from it? What was your point from it using that slide? Are you saying we should go back to, are you agreeing with them saying we should go back to more um, enforcement or fortress conversation, conservation to hit the crisis? Or what does that look like? What was your point or your conclusions from that? Thanks. Yeah, I think I'll go first. So Jens, yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's, as you said, that there's a long, tradition of uh, literature and counter mapping. 
Um, I think what is different now, and it kind of speaks to uh, Shayan's question as well, that um, conservation surveillance technologies have revolutionized in the last 10 years. Uh, with the kind of technologies that we are seeing, uh, it's not very, it's not the same as when, when say, Nancy Peluso was writing about countermapping. Uh, the countermapping literature that Nancy Peluso uh, wrote about, or even, uh, say, from Southeast Asia, Rajavali and Pai have written in Indonesia, uh, most look at, uh, you know, satellite imagery, uh, um, and which, uh, which are not really high resolution maps. Um, my work, it, you know, my take on counter mapping, I'm obviously trying to track that history as well, and I'm, I couldn't go in deep into it in 15 minutes. But I think what has changed really rapidly is that the conservation state, uh, NGOs and the government, their investment uh, financially in uh, digital technologies, fancy digital technologies like drones and camera traps, are, uh, are also appealing to the indigenous communities to use the same. Uh, now, these digital technologies are also very easily available in the market. Uh, their uh, prices have gone down. Drones are now available at very low cost rates. Uh, that makes it very easily available to, uh, you know, these communities. Plus, uh, involvement of civil rights groups uh, in these movements has also uh, intensified. So I think that uh, what is changing is uh, the rise in the kind of digital technologies that are being used in, in the tradition of countermapping. And that is something that I would like to track in, uh, you know, in my work. Shan, uh, coming to your question about um, why they are going for these fancy technologies, um, I don't have a concrete answer to that yet. But what uh, you know, what I am hearing or what I am seeing through uh, not just in this part of India but in other parts as well, that there is some sort of a technology race, uh, new technologies all the time, like. I'm sure you know that Forest Department is always fascinated by something new that comes into the market. Um, these communities are learning the same from the Forest Department. Uh, they're like, if they can use it, why can't we? And I think, again, civil rights groups, uh, Forest Rights Act groups, are playing a very vital role in this, saying that, yeah, camera traps are used by the Forest Department to produce a certain form of knowledge of tiger occupancy or of tiger ecology. You can do the same. Uh, you can document tigers in your own land. So I think, uh, and accessibility to the technology as well. Uh, so what is uh, what is fancy to the forest department is also fancy to uh, to the communities, and they want to challenge the forest department using their own tools. Um, I can answer your question. Um, so yeah, the uh, I agree with you um, definitely. With um, I think the thing is that. Organization like WCS, WWF, they were um, using sensationalism um, and a lack of concrete data to make these kind of claims. And I definitely don't agree with that. Um, and it was something I had a problem with while I was working for them. Um, and yeah, these kind of uh, press releases are generated to create this kind of sense of fear and crisis. Um, it's linked to the attempt to change funding narratives. Um, which then kind of trickles down to national level conservation practitioners. So that was something that I was very, um, had a big problem with. Uh, I can talk to you about like my own personal experiences with that. But yeah, it, that was the intent of the slide was to point out how that they use uh, sensationalism to kind of create these narratives. Yeah, I mean, I think I would just agree with Lee. I think that type of language that we're showing in the slide. Um, you know, Brian Masumi in, in his book, Onto Power, talks about how uh, these efforts to preempt uh, particular threats like the war on terror, you know, the invasion of Iraq and so forth, they're often based not on uh, like concrete data and facts and evidence, but tend to rely on um, what he calls affect, the creation of a attempts to create emotional responses, often through fear and sort of the, um, the idea that there, 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 there is an imminent threat, there is a crisis situation that has to be addressed. And I think that's what we see happening with Belize, is there's this attempt by international conservation organizations to create this sense that Belize is on the precipice of a threat, that there's a, a major crisis that's about to happen. And if conservation organizations don't take action now, that that crisis will, um, will occur. And I think even though that, that argument's based on uh, sort of very flimsy data, it's still being used 
now to reorient the entire protectionary management system in a way that is meant to address that crisis sort of before that crisis actually manifests. So I think it's, a, it's something that we see as, as quite problematic, actually. There was the other question. Oh, yeah, sorry. There was another question about the, the pause AI and the, and the algorithm. So the, uh, the algorithm, the predictive tool that's a component of SMART, it uses a lot of different sort of input components. It uses past ranger data that shows where um, sort of incursions and crimes have been located in parks in the past. It also uses um, geographic information from the parks, like topographic information, um, the locations of communities, park entrance points. Um, it uses weather, seasonal variations. Um, so there, there's actually a lot of different inputs, day and night variations. Um, but actually one of the factors that I think is really heavily weighted by the, by the pause algorithm is actually locations of protected areas that haven't been patrolled. So it looks at where rangers have patrolled protected areas, where they've found crimes in the past, but it actually places a really heavy emphasis on trying to drive rangers to parts and areas of protected areas that are what it perceives as being under patrolled. Uh, because in places like Africa and Southeast Asia where it's been trialed, it's proven to be, according to their, the results that they published, proven to be very effective at finding crime in locations which wouldn't normally be patrolled. Um, and I think this is part of an argument that the, the makers of the algorithm claim that this, this tool is actually better than what they call, they say it's better than human intuition. And they, they make the claim that like rangers on the ground make decisions based on intuition rather than what they call objective knowledge and data which I think is kind of a, obviously a problematic argument to make, really discounts local indigenous knowledge. Um, and I think an argument could be made that you know, this emphasis on pushing rangers toward under patrolled data is actually one of the biases in the algorithm. And it's actually been one of the major critiques from protected area managers who have, you, who have been trialing it in Belize is they're saying like, the algorithm's trying to send us to places in this, protect, in this park that, um, we know that nothing's happening there because it's basically inaccessible, but it's telling us to go there because patrols haven't gone there in the past. So anyway, that's some of the factors. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question about um, the changes um, like from across, across federal governments in Brazil. I think that's a very, very interesting, very important question because usually the the media coverage or like the um, the, the attention is is like between these governments and it usually goes from like Brazil as an environmental villain to Brazil as an environmental uh, a pioneer or something and that's that's uh, the, the usual line and my my research looks at more like the underlying continuities of this um, and and the way that these institutions of international cooperation actually stabilize. Uh, the, this this environment of, of economic cooperation so and and uh, but there are some changes of course because uh, for, for instance uh, the also under the bolsonaro government that actually like the system kind of couldn't be fixed anymore like the amazon fund for instance couldn't continue anymore so it was a, a, a crisis for international cooperation as well at the same time though uh, for instance the uk uh, continued cooperation with brazil and shopping in shocking ways uh, germany couldn't do so uh, or didn't do so also because uh, yeah the amazon fund was really like they were uh, of course um, because of the 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 uh, anti-environment, anti-social environmental government of Bolsonaro, it wasn't possible. But they they continued to cooperate with other partners. They continued to co cooperate with states, which, which is also very concerning. So the environmental registration, for instance, is something that has had uh, continuity across these governments, uh, governments, and it's something that actually boosted with, with the Lula government. And uh, under the Lula government, the, the environmental registry was also included in the new uh, in the in the forest court reform, but it's very interesting how international cooperation does this. There's also shifting of partners because they do that also in a way in 
promoting uh, carbon markets, for instance, because uh, the, the former Lula government or the, the former PUT government was very critical of, of carbon markets in the international system, but the international cooperation has always pushed this uh, within Brazil and within actors uh, that were more uh, more favorable of the system. So, and, and overall, um, the the last point is and that, that, the, that the agribusiness is just so strong in Brazil, such a strong uh, force in Brazilian politics, is that, uh, that this also always shapes.